If thanks goes, we will welcome everyone back for this afternoon's session, a uh, session devoted to one research project, which is Terawatt. Terawatt is funded by the EPSRC under the SuperGen Marine Challenge Program, Marine Challenge 1. Uh, and we come under the jurisdiction, I guess, of SuperGen UKC Mayor, the United Kingdom Centre for Marine Energy Research. The core partners for UKC Mayor, Exeter, Strathclyde, Queen's, and the whole coordination done by the University of Edinburgh, but a whole number of associate partners as well that you see at the, the bottom there. Oh, that's not helpful. Um, the Terrawatt's a kind of curious project because it actually came together under the auspices of Mars. In fact, Mars was instrumental in bringing the consortium together that bid or put in a proposal for the project. So that's ourselves at Herrick Watt University. Marine Scotland Science, I said that we're out there all in a while. The University of Edinburgh, Strathclyde University, and what was originally going to be Glasgow, but one of our researchers then moved to Swansea, and Swansea University as well, and the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, and it was in response to a series of questions posed by the regulatory authority, if you like, Marine Scotland Science, uh, that we framed the proposal. Questions being, what's the best way to assess wave and tidal energy resources? And to get some understanding on the feedback once we have any extraction, either from wave or tidal power, what are the physical consequences of doing this, of removing energy from the marine system? What are the ecological consequences of removing energy from the marine system? And really importantly, in trying to answer these questions, perhaps the most important task we set ourselves was to come up with standard modeling methodologies that could be universally used by others for wave and tidal developments. So as the proposal emerged, we were looking at a range of different possible software packages. But at that stage, we got involved with industry, with other stakeholders, who steered us very, very deliberately towards two, which was Mike and Delft3D. The reason being that as far as the industry is concerned, these are well-tried, well-tested packages, which the industry and the regulatory authorities have confidence in. So it makes a lot more sense to use these than to use software that's being tweaked by researchers who might not have the same confidence. Uh, in the outputs from. So the partners, well, Mars absolutely instrumental in providing the umbrella that brought us together, but they've also taken on the responsibility of organizing all of the steering group meetings, our outreach meetings, uh, like today's event, um, and played a very important role in that industry collaboration as well. The universities, my own Harriet Walt, Edinburgh, Highlands and Islands, and that's both Lewis Castle College as well as Sands. Originally, it was going to be Glasgow, obviously under Mars, but Koshini decided to move on to Swansea, so Swansea and Strathclyde. And with Marine Scotland Science as full consortium partners, and that's very important, having the regulator as part of that consortium, as well as having industry input to the steering group meetings and to our workshops. So we've had regular reporting through a steering group, meet, uh, steering group meetings as well as UKC Mayor, a project management committee, and importantly, regular workshops where we've drawn in device and software developers as well. Uh, I think one of the successes is we have something like seven now related PhD projects uh, connected to Terrawall, which weren't funded by EPSRC but have grown up around the consortium. I have tried to give just a general overview of the research to whet your appetite for what will now follow this afternoon. We're organized really in four basic work streams. Work stream one, led by Marine Scotland Science, really monitoring our progress against research questions, but having a very important role in bringing together all of the available data, but also determining what are realistic array scenarios for this first round of marine renewables development. Workstream 2, led by the University of Edinburgh, 
looking at the modeling of wave and tide, including the validation calibration, validation of those models. Work stream three, looking at sedimentary processes, both suspended sediments and coastal processes in terms of sediment dynamics. And you'll hear from both the University of Glasgow <coughs> and the University of Swansea this afternoon on that. Work stream four, led by ourselves on ecological modeling, and you'll hear from Mike Bell from Harriet Watt later on that. Importantly, there's a flow of data and methodologies from each of these work streams to other ones, and in that sense, it's an extraordinarily ambitious proposal. But the real outputs from this are the methods toolbox. What methods have we used? How have we arrived at those methods? Um, from all of the work streams, uh, an absolutely critical question. <laughs> Um, heuristic rather than deterministic. I'm convinced everyone involved in Terra 1 has got absolutely the right answer, but then how would I know? Uh, all we can hope for is that we've used robust methodologies uh, within the models and the uh, software we've been using. But we are confident we've used the best available data, and Marine Scotland Science has played a very important role in that. You'll hear from more from Rory in a little while. The position papers we have consolidated into a uh, booklet, which again has been organized by MAS, and there's copies of this at the back of the room. What we would ask is if you are going to take a copy, and you're very welcome to, please can you sign for it so we have a record of where these have gone. We only have a limited number of copies in published form, but the electronic version of this is now up on the MAS website you to download if you want. I think very importantly, right from the start, we set out as well as using established methods in terms of the software to meet the requirements of the regulatory authorities. Um, we're still moving towards an understanding of significance, and certainly to a large extent, it's Marine Scotland's inputs on that that are equally important to our own thinking. But you'll hear a little bit on that this afternoon to stress the pivotal roles, I think, played by Master Marine Scotland Science at the start, but also by the other stakeholders. And there's one person here, I won't embarrass her, but she knows who she is, who's attended every single one of our steering group meetings and every single one of our workshops and made important contributions from industry to the project as it's gone along. And that kind of input as well has been incredibly important to what we've, we've been trying to do. Um, I've been involved in a lot of research projects. I think Terrawatt is probably one of the most ambitious. It's ambitious not only in its substance and scale, but it's ambitious also in the timescales we allow ourselves for the flow of data and methods from each work stream to the next. So you will notice, I'm sure, sooner or later, there are a couple of papers, position papers, missing from this, which will be added finally to the electronic version and will be available uh, on the website. But Workstream 4 has suffered, I think probably most, being the last, requiring data from the other work streams. Um, but you will have a presentation on that this afternoon. So that's the plan for this afternoon. I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, uh, or should I say anyone's glory, uh, as they give presentations on each of the work streams and the work they've done. Um, but I thought, as well as the publications we've engaged in during the progress of the project, and as well as the position papers which are now published all but um, the last one in this booklet, uh, we are also planning, and this might take a little bit longer, uh, a special issue of a journal. It's perhaps an unusual journal to pick for something that's really focused on modeling, but um, it's the Journal of Ocean and Coastal Management, and it's the journal that's mostly read by the regulatory authorities themselves. So the idea of the journal special issue is to draw out the lessons learned as part of the research for the regulatory authorities, whereas the position papers are much more technical and deal with the methodologies and the data and so on that we've used. That's all I'm going to say, and I'm going to pass on very quickly now to the first speaker and welcome up uh, Rory if you're ready, Ahara Murray from Marine Scotland Science.
Okay, thank you, John, for that overview there. Um, I'm going to try and um, elaborate on this question a little bit. At the same time, I'm going to um, tell you all a little bit about the main involvement that Marine Scotland Science had with, um, with this project. Um, so I'm going to start with this figure here. I think you're all familiar with the Pentland Firth and Orkney Waters, and this is the, the round one um, strategic area, um, and it shows the areas that have been leased by the Crown Estate to developers for wave and tidal energy developments. Um, I'm showing it here because it's really the setting for Terrawatt. Um, the, the areas indicated leased by the Crown Estate, Crown Estate these are just broad areas, um, but developers um, within these areas really need to, one thing they have to think about is to narrow down where they're going to put devices in there. And some of the issues that they might face, some of the questions they might want to think about when, when thinking about where to put devices are the bed conditions, um, the distance from shore, um, device array effects, um, the resource, so where, where's the best places to put these from a power perspective, um, the water depth, um, the environmental impact, and then remembering that these are very sort of fast flow and turbulent areas, um, so it's an environment, a very challenging environment to put devices and to work in as well. Um, but terawatt aims really were to try and look at the environmental impact, um, not necessarily from a um, sort of, not necessarily to, to try and decide where devices will be put in the round one um, developments, but maybe to try and influence where future um, rounds of leasing might be in the Pentland Firth and Orkney Waters. Um, but it was hard for us to ignore the resource as well, and I'll come back to that a little bit. But those are two things we sort of focused on. Um, so just a little bit, marine renewable, en about marine renewable energy licensing in Scotland. Um, marine Scotland um, licensing and operations deal with marine renewable energy licensing. Um, developers require a um, marine license and a section 36 consent. Um, as part of this, they usually have to do an environmental impact assessment um, and, to, and the environmental statement is an important product of this. Um, small projects don't necessarily have to do this. Um, they just have to get a marine license application. Um, but as part of this licensing process, um, it goes through various stages and lots of reports are produced, including scoping reports, um, assessment, assessment methodologies, and then finally um, environmental statement and the environmental impact assessment. Um, but I highlight these stages because um, during that process, um, developers have had to make quite a lot of decisions um, to try and narrow down some of the environmental impacts. And these have formed quite useful documents for us to use during this project to help decide where a lot of the devices have gone or might go. Um, so some challenges to date. Um, people have had to do a lot of resource characterization for the first round of licensing. Um, there's lots, been lots of baseline survey work. Um, there's been hydrodynamic modeling um, going on for specific sites, both from a resource, resource characterization perspective, but also to think about the physical processes and during the impacts assessment. Um, and just some sort of issues that have um, really dominated the EIA process include things like migrating fish from a tidal turbine collision perspective, uh, marine mammals, both noise and collision, and, and birds, that, yes, diving birds and collision risk. And then cumulative impacts as well have featured, and there's still a lot, a lot of uncertainties with this, and I'll come back to that later on. So as John has already said, um, Marine Scotland Science were involved right from the beginning of Terrawatt and really helped to shape um, the research questions and targets for the project. Um, so we've, we thought about what is the best way to assess wave and tidal energy um, resources and then what um, feedbacks um, there are to this when you start extracting energy from the resource as well. Um, what the physical consequences are of extracting energy and then what are the knock-on ecological consequences of taking um, energy out in a big way from these, these areas. And then, of course, the development of standard modelling methodologies toolbox. So the main roles of um, Marine Scotland Science in Terrawatt were these ones. As um, this was originally envisaged in the in the proposal, um, overseeing the spatial data availability and requirements for um, for, for the modelling, um, the development of realistic array scenarios for us to model. Um, thinking about the acceptability acceptability of impacts and acceptable criteria. And, and to do, get involved with the knowledge exchange activities. And Marine Scotland Science have um, hosted workshops um, liaising with developers along the way. Um, so just very quickly, a quick overview about the data acquisition and processing that we're involved in. 
with. Um, the aspiration was to try and use open data as much as possible um, so that other people can reproduce um, what we're doing and follow the same methods. Um, this wasn't always achievable um, for various reasons, but um, we tried to we, we stuck with that um, most of the time. Um, Marine Scotland provided an FTP site for sharing data in the project, and this is just a list of some of the data types that um, we sort of gathered together during the project. And the ones in red are the ones that um, weren't really aren't going to be open for other people to, to use in the future. Um, like they, they, you know, maybe something can be done about that, but. Um, the figure um, there just shows the AECP data locations that we used during the project. Some of those were from, um, some of those are existing data. The one in the north is at the EMEC site, um, and we had to purchase those data from EMEC. And then Marine Scotland Science actually did some survey work during the project on their research vessel, Scotia. Um, so now, just going back to the Pen and Firth and Orkney Waters and the round one um, scenario here. Um, this, this obviously just shows some of the broad areas where devices are going to be placed. And we did some work to try and pinpoint where in those areas <coughs> devices might be placed. Um, and, and as I've already said, really, we, we relied heavily on the licensing documentation. So this is an example from um, the environmental impact assessment um, for the inner sound development. And, shows, and from that, we got sort of rough device spacings that are going to be likely um, for these projects, and we used a, a, a downstream separation of about 160 meters and a cross-stream cross -stream separation of 45 meters. Um, and, but to think about where they might be placed within the within the areas, we didn't we didn't we did do some resource characterization, um, but we we built a um, an algorithm to to use existing um, baseline resource maps um, to develop a sort of um, a repetitive method that can be used to place the devices um, in a logical way in these areas. So as I've said, we use these spacings and we use a staggered spacing. Um, we had to make some refinements for some twin turbine rotors. Um, and we used a number of constraints to constrain the area. So we used, the, obviously, the lease areas. Um, we we um, used the water depth. We used the distance from distance from some of devices for some areas. I won't go into that in great detail. And then, but the main um, constraint was really the resource within the area as well. Um, so this just shows that sort of that, that algorithm going step by step through it. This is for the I think Duncan's B Head development um, in the sort of south southeast end of the Pendant Firth. And you can see we filled it with devices, and then we've set some limits on water depth in the middle plot, and then on the on the right hand plot. Um, we removed a lot of devices from areas of poor resource. So I mean, this, this method definitely has limitations, but it was the method we used for, for building up some kind of first pass um, array scenarios for us to model in the, in the Pentland Firth. Um, so now moving on, this is just an example of um, a wave development um, and where oyster devices off the west coast of Orkney might be placed. And the, in, this is the environmental impact assessment again. And um, we use these data to build up a picture of where wave devices might be placed. So this was the, ah, uh, these might be slightly out of order. I'll jump over to this one. Um, wave arrays, um, six wave de um, de deployment sites, four Palamis, one Oyster, um, one AWS wave absorber. Um, but what we found was that we didn't really have to go back to the resource in the same way as we did for the tidal sites in order to decide where to put them. And then. Oh no, I should have showed this one before. This is the final build out for the, for the tidal arrays. And then this is the, um, the final um, array scenario we, we developed for the, for the wave arrays. And these fed into the subsequent work packages and modeled by modelers and both hydrodynamic models and then used in the ecological models as well. So just some take home messages from this talk. Um, Marine Scotland Science were involved from the outside by helping to design the research questions. Um, we were able to coordinate the data gathering to an extent. Um, Marine Scotland Science, having close links with the regulator, we were able to arrive at realistic um, large array, array scenarios. Um, we feel the regulator is well placed to provide guidance on the acceptability of impacts. Um, but this is really proving to be a bit of an iterative process, and we want to look at um, both results from the final modeling work and then feeding that back to um, other um, important sort of governance issues um, to do with acceptability of impacts. 
Um, so the work here has just started and will be continued into the future. So I put this one in because um, I found this quite interesting because when we started Terawatt, um, a lot of the license, so what this shows is um, where licensing and operations are with a lot of the renewable, well, all of the renewable energy projects around Scotland at the moment. And on the left hand side it shows projects where, um, which are still at a pre-application, they're putting in scoping reports. The middle column shows projects which are undergoing environmental impact assessments at the moment. And then the ones on the right are the projects which have received, which have gone through the whole process and have some kind of license to go ahead. And when we, um, and all of those have some kind of license with the exception of the development land in Mont Crows, which was cancelled. Um, and when we started Terrawatt, it was really, everything was very heavy towards the left hand side with a few projects in the middle EIA process. And it's just interesting to see how it's all gone to the other side now. And we're really looking ahead to putting things in the water and maybe thinking about what's going to inform us for the next round of licensing that's going to come, hopefully come along. Um, so future challenges as we move into marine renewable energy implementation, um, I think array layout optimization is going to be really important. Um, this is going to include, involve a lot of modeling, including CFD. Um, there's going to be a lot of post consensus monitoring and surveys going on as we start to put things in the water. I think there's sort of opportunities there for joined up monitoring and opportunities for new and novel sampling techniques, potentially. Um, I think we're going to have to start thinking about the sustainability of very large arrays and the cumulative impacts of, of lots of arrays are going to become very important as well. And Terawatt sort of started grappling with some of that, um, but I think there's lots of room in the future for future, for future work. Um, so just looking um, ahead now, um, this shows the current sites that have been leased by the Crown Estate, not just for wave and tide, but for offshore wind as well. Um, but there's, there's large aspirations for the future to, dele to, really, to lease many more sites. These aren't leased sites, but these are areas of search which have been identified marine, within the Scottish Government's Marine Spatial Plan. Um, and if you just zoom into the Pendant Firth, where a lot of the tidal resources, this is the, the area, the red line identified within the Marine Spatial Plan. And if we really want to get large um, energy out there, which we aspire to in the future, we're really going to have to put in a lot of tidal devices. Uh, in green shows the terawatt ones, and orange is just a, a made-up array, um, which isn't necessarily very sensible, but it's, it's the sort of um, arrays that we might have to put in if we want to get out the order of you know, five gigawatts out of the dependent firth. Um, so cumulative effects um, and the consequence of very large arrays is going to be, is going to be really important. And I think the major challenge, well, from my perspective, is um, to consider how to optimize the power return um, for these very large arrays and to minimize the environmental impact at the same time. And I don't think it's an easy sort of trade-off one of the way. You might find there's clear advantages of having arrays both in one configuration, both from an energy yield perspective, but also from environmental impact. So um, thanks very much for listening. Um, so the question was how much data is on, online um, provided by marine licensing operations. Um, pretty much all of the documents that have gone through the licensing process should be online. There's probably a bit of a lag. Um, Gail, am I right in saying that? Yeah. 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 And that's the place to look. Thank you. Do we have any more? We don't. That's fine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Venki Venkopal from uh, Institute for Energy Systems at Emory University. My title is this, <coughs> Wave Power Resource Modeling for Scottish Waters using a third generation um, spectral wave model. I'm going to show this again. You've seen this already two times from John's and uh, um, Rory's. But if you read this, these three questions are the key elements of our research. But you can't find answer to these questions without constructing a wave model. So that was the main reason we went on to construct a new 
wave model. Um, you may have already heard there are research institutions in the world. They are running their own model. But the output you get from those models are, it is there for their purpose. But for our purpose, we may not get all the answers from their model. And that's why we went on to construct our own model. And also another reason, when we started the research in 2012, so this was the resource map available to us. If you look at the left-hand side, where the wave resources are, you only see boxes, a large box covering the whole or half of um, Orkney Islands, indicating one particular value of the resource, which is not true. And there was another reason we went on to construct our own model. Uh, that's uh, the grid uh, or the time um, computational domain of the model. Uh, we have covered the whole North Atlantic so that you can capture all the long distance swells traveling um, through North Atlantic and reaching our shores. And what we did when we constructed the model, we have followed uh, three or four zones um, of uh, defining the grids. So we had very fine grid close to our uh, deployment, uh, wave energy deployment sites, and then slightly increased the, the grid resolution um, to a higher level. Um, you could see that from, we started with 0 0.005 degree is the one grid cell area, and then we went on to 0 0.01 degree and so on. So this captures all the, uh, uh, the, the process that is occurring close to the shows. Um, that was intention to have this finer grid. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the terms you see here. Um, sorry if you, if you are not familiar with this. Uh, this is, I'm, I'm just quickly going to go over this to tell you we have used uh, the standard commercial software Mike 21, which John mentioned in, the, in, the, in his uh, presentation. And the industry involved within our research, they wanted us to use Mike 21 as uh, it would be useful for them to get output directly from us and then use it into, um, into their models, which again, Mike 21. Um, just to quickly uh, tell you, we used the spectral formulation, which is fully, I call it as fully spectral formulation because we run the model using wind input, nothing else. And you could see the spectral discretization in a frequency domain. We started with 0 0.035 hertz uh, to um, up to 1.2 hertz, I think. So we had a 25 frequency intervals. Similarly, we have 24 directional intervals. So it would cover all the waves uh, frequencies, or uh, most of the wave frequencies, um, including the swell wave and the directions 360 degrees. And the table on the right hand side shows you the output we get out of the model. So we get significant wave height, peak wave period, um, mean wave period, mean wave directions, and so on. So these are all the parameters we need to calculate the wave power and other parameters like um, um, radiation stresses, particle velocities, and things like they are used uh, by other work packages, for example, Mike uses the radiation stresses as, a, as an output. Mike Heath uses um, some other parameters from the model and the Bharshini group uses the wave current interaction parameters. So it was worth constructing a wave model um, for several reasons. And just to, to let you know that we used uh, the wind to run the model. The wind has come from ECMWF, European Center for Medium Weather Forecast. And the spatial resolution of the wind input is 0.125 degree by 0.125. The temporal resolution is six hours. I want to make a note here. I have used six hours, but I'm going to show you some uh, pictures later on to, uh, uh, to illustrate whether changing this six hours to something else will have any effect or not. And this is again uh, what is uh, disabled, what is um, switch it on uh, is given here. So we have not included diffraction. The reason including wave diffraction 
would take very long time to, to complete the simulation um, and it sometimes it ends up error as well. So we disabled it, but we noticed disabling diffraction has negligible effect on our results. Um, energy transfer, quadruplet wave interaction was activated. We used wave breaking and we uh, switched on the bottom friction. Um, we used the white capping. But there was a problem in the, in the initial stage. We didn't know what value of white capping to be used. The value that comes with the software as a default is 4.5. But later on, we found out that that may not be the right value. So you could see here the, the results um, in a moment. Um, before we say the model is doing what we are expecting it to do, we have to do this calibration and validation. Uh, for that purpose, we have used six, seven locations. I think six locations are shown here for the, the calibration and validation of the models. Um, when we did the calibration initially with white capping, white, do you know what is white capping? Yes. The white capping is the foaming of the wave breaking at the surface and it loses energy by white capping. So um, when we tried to model white capping uh, with the different values, the results were different. So the default value gave us very high uh, significant wave height at the top and the, the black color is the measured one, red is the model value. Um, they were far away and then we played with the different values and then we found the last one with the white capping coefficients 1.5 matched very well with the, um, the model uh, measurements. And you could see the peak wave period again for different um, white capping values. Um, I would say again, <clears throat> the white capping with the 0.15, 1.5 worked very well for us. Um, there was a story to tell you about the North Sea locations. We have considered two North Sea locations, uh, Murray Firth and Firth of Firth. As I mentioned in the beginning, we have used a different grid resolutions. So the one on the top <clears throat> was the one we thought would work. But that gave a result of significant wave by peak period. There were large differences. So we had to go and alter the resolutions. We put extra measures here to cover both Borefak and Perta uh, Fourth. That improved the results uh, better. Finally, after previous um, uh, several checks, um, we managed to do some hand casting. So you could see three parameters, wave height, a peak wave period, peak wave directions are compared here against the measurement uh, for one location which is on the North Atlantic. Another location again in the North Atlantic but slightly up. Um, again, the results are fine. Um, Orkney, EMEC location, um, the results are again very good. Uh, they compare very well with the, the Orkney OIs. So if you want to see how the wave height spatially varies, um, this is the, the result. So you could see the red spot, which is the largest wave height, reaching up to 14 meters sometimes. So this simulation was done for 2012. Um, and this is how the spatial distribution of the wave height is. So all the largest waves are reaching the Scottish or Irish um, coast. Um, and you could see the values changing. Um, they are for every 30 minutes, I think. So we could see the, the values changing uh, from one time step to another time step. Um, we worked out the wave power. And um, what you see on the top is the mean wave power calculated over a year period in 2010, and that's the maximum wave power. And I showed this to some people. I had a workshop recently from uh, uh, people who came from overseas, and they were um, surprised, not surprised, they were just jealous to see this kind of uh, energy. We are getting thousands of kilowatts, uh, which was not the case for them. And that's the mean wave power. Sorry, mean wave power, maximum wave power at every uh, 30 minutes um, location. And for 
uh, sort of comparison, I put the map uh, from uh, AVP map, which is the prone estate model. And if you look at the, the one somewhere here and then there, they compare quite well. Uh, again, I, I want to remind you that this is based on one, um, one, one, one year record. And as I said in the beginning, I wanted to look at, so set all the parameters same, but vary the wind uh, temporal resolution. Start wind at one hour, three hours, six hours. So what difference it would have? It did have some impact. Uh, John has already put his hands on. So I'm going to go fast. Um, you could see some variations between these three wind input, in wave height, and uh, wave period. It may not be clear, but if you look at very close, you could see the differences are there. And the mean wave direction. And finally, when I worked out the power, there was some difference. So the question is, this is a power, you see for four sides, corresponding to one hour temporal resolution, six hours temporal, three hours of temporal resolution. Uh, but I can't tell you which one is right. The reason we didn't have measured wave power or measured the parameters to calculate the wave power. So one of these should be right. I don't know which one is either six hours, three hours, or one hour. I could tell you if I have the measurement. Um, I think that's where I'm stopping. Thank you. Yeah, this is just a small part of uh, what we have done for terawatt. Uh, given the 12 minutes, I don't think I can cover a lot. So just you know, compressed one part. But there is so much to learn from a terawatt. If you are interested, you can talk to us, talk to John. We have done more than what you've seen here. Okay. Any questions? For Any questions quickly? Yeah. Sorry, it's a pretty quick actually. Um, I just wonder, I'm not a modeler, so why why did they extending the model down the east coast in preference, and whether or not that's for computational reasons or for physical, like there's something physical about the wave resource? That um, the initial mesh was less denser than we extended the mesh. The initial mesh, if you have a wider, or coarse mesh, you are not picking up all the undulations in the in the sea bottom, uh, bottom friction and other parameters are not correctly picked up. And that's why when we increase the mesh size, so you calculate, you make the calculation for every center of the mesh, so that, that increases the number of calculations, improves the accuracy. Okay, Thank you. Cool. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm not going to tell you the objectives of terawatt. <laughs> um, what I'm going to mention is this morning we heard a lot about uh, very small scale effects, about collisions, and about scour and so on. But what we're focusing on this afternoon is much, much more zoomed out. We're saying what happens a kilometer over here, five kilometers over here, etc. cetera. Um, so what I'm going to give you is a very brief, fairly non-technical overview, I apologize to any engineers, um, of the methods we've used to put tidal turbines into these tidal models, and also a very brief overview with some sample results. Uh, for more details on the methods, have a look in the position papers in the book there. Uh, for more details on the results, I'm afraid you've got to wait for the special issue of the journal, and they'll be in there. Um, but as John said, we've been instructed by industry that Mike 3 and Delta 3D are the two tidal models to use. Um, and also importantly, we shouldn't modify them. Um, and I'll come on to where that becomes relevant a little bit later with Delta 3D. But these are the two models that were built, um, and they were put together quite deliberately by different teams at different universities. So there was no attempt to make them as equal to each other as possible. Instead, it was a case of, if we were a real consultancy, say, we'd be working with one model, we'd use the tools that work best with that model. And so we'd use them to use, we'd try to use the methods that we would use for that model if we weren't trying to compare them. So you can see immediately that there's a big difference in their computational meshes. Um, on the left, we have Mic3 which uses an unstructured triangular mesh. Um, the advantage of that is that the triangles can fit around the coastlines and get you the shape of things very nicely. And also that you can vary the size of the triangles according to the area you're working in. So around the edges, where we're not really too fussed what's going on, 
the triangles are up to five kilometers on a, on a side. When we get right in towards where the turbines are, it gets down to about 150 meters. Delta 3D doesn't do that. It uses a regular structured rectangular mesh, grid I should say, and that gives you the problem if you take the high resolution you need where the turbines are and apply that to the whole grid, you have a computationally horrendous problem. Um, so what, what one does is you take a coarse mesh and a fine mesh, embed one within the other, and it's fully coupled uh, nesting so that each model can affect, the inner model can affect the outer model and vice versa. Uh, in this case, the outer model is on a one kilometer grid and the inner one I think is 200 meters. Some other parameters for the models, the grids we've talked about, the domains we've talked about. Um, the open boundaries, so where we're driving the models by specifying the water levels and how they change at the edges, they're both ultimately derived from the top X Poseidon satellite altimetry data, but they've come via different routes. And the reason for this is that in Mike we've used the system that comes with Mike, and in Delft we've used the Oracle State University system that is bundled with the Delft package. Um, so they both come from the same satellite altimetry data, but they go through different tidal models that that data is assimilated into and had to produce slightly different um, actual predictions at the boundaries. Turbulence models are different, but we've done some sensitivity testing there and found it makes very little difference to the outputs that we're getting from these models. Um, and the bathymetry is the same in both of them. So some example results, what we're looking at here from each model is the depth average current, the mean depth average current speed taken over a full month. And the first thing I'll note is they are very similar, which is really very encouraging. Because um, as I said, we had two models being done totally separately by different groups. And qualitatively, looking at the layout of where the fast areas are, the slow areas are, they're very, very similar. Um, to get a more quantitative look at that, um, we put it on a scatter plot um, where the x-axis is the prediction from Mike, the y-axis is the prediction from Delta 3D uh, for each point. And again, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship. It's nice and tight. There's a little bit of structure in there. Um, so that line that sticks out at the bottom, I'm fairly sure, is the coastlines, which might tend us to have it going a bit too fast. Um, so you can see a few things like that, but in, in general, they're producing very similar results, which is encouraging. However, the, both the models have been tuned to match the same measurements. So the important thing here is not that they produce the same mean speed over the model. They have to because they've been tuned to do that. The important thing is the spatial distribution the same in both. But to get that, get them both matching the same measurements, it turns out our two teams have ended up using a bed resistance value that's over twice as high in one than the other. Not a problem for this. When we start calculating the bed stress, which is one of the values of more interest to people doing sediments and people looking at biology, um, the calculation of the bed stress involves the value of the bed resistance. And so here's the bed stress. Uh, this is only an average over 24 hours rather than a month, I'm afraid. That's just because I ran out of computing time. Um, again, the spatial distribution looks very, very similar, but note that the scales are different. Um, and the Mike 3 model is giving roughly twice the predictions of the Delta 3D model. And when we put that on a scatter plot, sure enough, it's a nice tight line, but it's about a 1 to 2 ratio. Now, for the purposes of terawatt, this is not actually a huge problem because talking to the people in later work streams doing the biological work, they're telling me that what, they, what they're actually using the bed stress for is as an ordinal index of effectively a ranking where the highest points of stress are. And what they're interested in is how it changes when we add turbines. But for some other purposes, where the absolute stress is important, this is something we need to be concerned about and we need to look at why the two models need such different values, which I'm still looking into. Moving on to extracting energy from them, though. Um, historically, a lot of people have extracted energy from models simply by increasing the seabed resistance, that same bed resistance we were just talking about, to simulate the turbines. And when you're working in 2D, that's perfectly valid. Once you start working in 3D, you can't do that anymore because you'd be removing all the momentum at the bottom instead of where the turbine is. Now, for purposes of this work, we've assumed we're dealing with a turbine sitting on the seabed a certain distance above it, uh, anchored to the seabed. But a complication is that both models use what are called sigma layers, which means you have the same number of layers between the seabed and the sea surface, and as the tide rises and falls, those layers expand and contract. So that means that our fixed turbine is moving between layers as the tide moves. That becomes quite important later. 
Um, but what we're aiming to do, and what, uh, what we do in both models in the end, is we calculate which layers intercept the rotor. We calculate the thrust force from the turbine, the retarding force on the, on the flow, and we divide that force equally between the layers that it intersects. And you'll notice that's not quite realistic because it's a circular rotor, not a rectangular one, uh, but it's an approximation that's been made in both models. So what is this turbine that we're using? Um, there's actually a few, few companies recently have published their power curves and published specifications. Um, but when we started this work a couple of years ago, nobody would talk about that stuff, at least not in a way that they'd know you to publish. So what we did was um, Marine Scotland Science organized a workshop with a number of developers. And <coughs> excuse me, we sat down and we agreed these parameters for a generic turbine that they all agreed was plausible for the first generation independent Firth. <coughs> Um, so we've got, as you see, a custom speed of one meter a second and a rating speed of two and a half meters a second, which ought to give us somewhere between one and one and a half megawatts in not necessarily the perfect site, but the not quite perfect sites you still end up using if you want to get a separate amount of energy. <clears throat> and that thrust curve, um, that thrust curve on the top right is the important thing, because we're saying a turbine isn't a dumb object, it's not like a rock, it doesn't have a constant drag, um, it's an intelligent machine with control surfaces and hydrodynamics going on. Um, and below a certain level, it just cuts out. Above a certain level, it starts deliberately shedding energy to avoid overloading itself, and hence we get that curve emerging. So in Mike, <coughs> excuse me, in Mike it's fairly straightforward. Mike has an internal implementation of a tidal turbine object, and you can fill in using this form on the left. You can fill in the coordinates of the turbine, the vertical position of it, uh, this diameter. And that table you see at the bottom is filling in that thrust curve that we were talking about. Um, the only problem is you have to fill it in for every turbine. And for our purpose, you'd want to a thousand turbines. And I wasn't prepared to do that much typing. So we produced a MATLAB script that simply takes a text file provided by Marine Scotland Science called the coordinates and inserts that into the mic model for us. Um, that script may well be useful to anyone else who's using mic out there, and it, we've made it available online, details at the end. Um, top right there is um, the layout of 400 turbines in inner sound as provided by Marine Scotland Science, and the bottom is the same thing appearing within the mic GUI. Gel 3D is trickier because Gel 3D doesn't know about turbines. <clears throat> so what we've had to do instead is write code to take that same list of turbine locations and relate it to the Gel 3D grid and convert it into an equivalent set of porous plates that we can insert into the model that are calculated to remove the same amount of momentum. And it's the same, same set of turbines there, and at the bottom is this grid of porous plates that we end up with, where the darker ones are denser, that block more of the flow, and the, the yellower ones are more porous. This gives us a few limitations because Delta 3D is not designed for porous plates to move around during a simulation. Um, it means we can't we can't have a variable thrust coefficient. We can't use that curve that we were talking about because we can't vary how porous a plate is from one time step to another. So we've simply taken the thrust coefficient at the rate of speed as an approximation. Um, a porous plate can't move up and down between sigma layers, so we've had to take the mean position of the turbine in the water column, effectively when the when it halfway halfway between high water and low water. Uh, so there's an inaccuracy from that. Most importantly is the fact that a porous plate can't turn. Um, so whereas in Mike we've made the assumption that the turbine will always face into the flow at any given moment, in Delta 3D we've had to pick a direction for each turbine, which we've taken as being the dominant direction where it gets the strongest current in a tidal cycle, um, and it has to stay there. And in a site where the current is rectilinear, it goes back and forth in opposite directions, that's no problem whatsoever. On a site such as some of the ones in the Benham Firth, where it's not 180 degrees between ebb and flood, that means Delta 3 is not going to get things quite right. There's another issue I'm going to touch on very, very briefly while we're working on this. Um, we found there's a bit of an error in the way that both of these models, in fact all models of this type, represent turbines, whereby when you get to grid sizes below about 150 meters or so, you start to underpredict the effect of the turbines. It's not as bad as it looks here, because that y-axis doesn't go to zero, but essentially you're losing about 10 to 15% of the force when you get below 100 meters, um, which is not ideal. So we've done some early work on um, correcting for that, and the correction looks more like that, which is much more satisfactory. At present, it's only useful, we've only tested this in idealized test channels, but in the next few months, they're going to be working on that, and hopefully make it more useful, more generally useful. 
Um, again, the code for this correction is on the web for details at the end. There's a paper that I gave at a conference a couple of weeks ago describing how it works. Details of that at the end. What happens when we add turbines? Here are some results. What we're looking at here in each model is, again, the depth average current speed over a month. <coughs> but we're looking at the difference in it between a run with no turbines and a run with the turbines. Um, and the locations of the turbines, I haven't highlighted them here, but as Rory showed earlier, there's a large set in the inner sound and on Douglasby Head. Uh, there's a set just off the southern tip of South Romersley in the middle right, and there's another set at Cantic Head in the top left. And you can see in both cases, as we expect, we see a decrease in the speed, excuse me, decrease in the speed through the actual array. Uh, and we also see, especially in the inner sound where it's constrained, we see an increase in speed either side of the array, because, of course, we've put an impedance there, we put a blockage in, so the water starts to speed around it. Um, we also see it, it's probably invisible on the screen, but there's also a very faint red throughout the whole of the rest of the pendulum Firth, because we put a blockage in, in some of the channels, we've slightly, slightly increased the speed in the other channels. Um, in general, we're reasonably happy here that things are fairly consistent between the two models. There certainly are more differences here than there were, we're looking at the undisturbed speeds. Part of, it is part of the differences are explained by the difference I described in directionality, that the turbines and the really can't yaw. And that particularly explains the differences on, the, um, on this side here. Um, I've actually tried simulating fixed angle turbines in mic, and they pretty much looks the same then. The differences down here are not simply due to that. I haven't figured out exactly what's causing those. So we have some slight spatial differences, but we're seeing broadly the same effects. Changes in bread stress magnitude, well, there'd be no point in showing the absolute changes because, as we said earlier, one model produces twice the bed stress as the other. So what we're looking at here is the change in bed stress magnitude as a proportion of the undisturbed value. And when we do that, I apologize for the weedy colors. I got the scale a bit wrong on here. But when we do that, again, it looks pretty similar. We've got the same spatial differences as we have when looking at the difference in speeds. But the degree of change that we're seeing is, again, quite similar between the two models. Uh, that's the main content of what I've got to show you. Um, various acknowledgements to people who've offered valuable advice and also valuable data, and various contacts there for getting in touch with us or for downloading uh, code or papers. Um, any questions? Um, that may just work. Oh. <laughs> um, so in your model, it seemed like in the pen that there was an increase in current velocity and um, bottom and shear. Best stress. Yes, yeah, yeah, best stress. Stress. So the same thing, bottom shear um, stress. The values, I appreciate for the bed stress, they differ between the models. But are they, in the grand scheme of things, what the under the natural variability, are they significant increases that they could cause problems, scour our coastal erosion? Um, I think the second part of that question, you would need to ask an expert on sediments and scour, which I'm not. <laughs> um, <coughs> the it will follow. The we're looking at the differences in speeds. Uh, the in the extreme of the inner sound, where we have the most turbines, we were looking at up to in terms of the month on average, we're looking at up to half a meter a second drop in speed um, in an area that normally gets guessing around three, three and a half meters per second. So I'd imagine that's probably significant. Um, but it's, whether it's acceptable is another matter which I'm certainly not competent to comment on. Okay, thanks. Just quickly, um, I'm probably going to jump in ahead here because we're, we'll get to the ecological package in, yes. in a second. Uh, but uh, a colleague at, at Sam's uh, just luckily uh, got a data set for his core reckon model mm -hmm. where with a local uh, person that was working on his uh, seabed. Uh, seabird feeding, uh, so tracking birds using eddies, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, is that type of model going to be used for habitat uh, mapping for, for seabirds in that area? Because obviously uh, changes in, in shear, for example, might bring uh, prey items closer to the surface of the water. Uh, it might be useful foraging uh, areas for, for local species of birds. Um, I don't know, and I don't see why well. not, but Beth is making gestures, though she has an answer. Two years ahead. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
But and I it's guess. equal one, I think John will explain it. Right. And the temperature, but I don't know if we can get to the scales, yeah. physical scales at that size. So those are some of the questions that are being asked. Really good question. I should. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, here what I'm trying to do is to give you an overview of uh, what we did under uh, WP3 sediment, trans uh, sediment dynamics modeling in TerraWatt. Uh, I should mention Dr. Ian Fairley, who is uh, the postdoctoral researcher for me uh, on the project, uh, who worked mo did most of the work, and Antonia Chatsilga, who is a PhD student um, attached to TerraWatt. Right, the uh, the 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 outline of the presentation is that I'll give you a brief overview of what the importance of uh, sediment dynamics and its impacts on the, the tidal energy extraction. And then a little bit on data requirements, but I'm not going to talk a lot there uh, because Rory mentioned about the data availability and the data we use here. And then going into that, impacts of tidal energy extraction on sediment dynamics using both the MIC and DELF models. And finally, um, showing you some of the, the, the modeling that we did and the results. Okay, uh, think, think a little, little bit about the uh, impacts of tidal energy extraction. Actually, it can be, there are many ways that the energy extraction can impact on the seabed sediment dynamics, which will eventually may have some effects on ecology as well. So um, the, it, the, the extraction of tidal energy can change the, the, the hydrodynamic regime, which can then change the sediment transport pathways, sediment transport magnitudes, and then finally affecting the morphology. And also the, the wave current interaction can have some secondary impacts on the, uh, the, the, uh, the current regime and then finally on the, uh, the sediment dynamics. And when it comes to wave energy extraction, it is the, the, the change in wave characteristics like wave height, period, etc., which can have some impacts on the, the seabed sediment dynamics. And as a, a secondary effects, of course, it changes the near-shore circulation, which can have impacts on the, the, the in near, near field and also far field impacts on the sediment dynamics on the seabed. Um, in terms of the, 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 the importance, actually, in the subtidal region, as I mentioned you earlier, that it can change the, uh, the sediment pathway, sediment, uh, the, the, um, the pathway magnitudes which can have ecological impacts, and it may have impacts on the coastal protection side, where, especially in the case of uh, wave energy extraction, where the wave field will be more intense, so that less, less sediment will be moved, and less, um, movement of, uh, ero uh, less movement of sediment can have less impacts on the seabed, etc. Um, and also, it may have potential uh, navigation hazards, uh, where the sediment movement can create shallow water, shallow areas, shallower than uh, initially, the area shallower than initially they were, so it, it may have some impacts on the, the, the navigation. And in the supertidal or intertidal region, impacts may be more intense, where ecological, I mean, it, they are shallow areas, so the impacts, any changes to seabed can have impacts on the ecological regime or beach stability or maybe on recreational functions in those areas. Now, in this case, what we did was the, the study side, we talked in um, previous um, talks, gave you a good idea where we are uh, modeling. Now, in this, for sediment transport study, actually, we selected two different um, areas within the, the large study area here for the simple reason that because of the computational intensity, we can't model the entire opening waters. And at the same time, most of the, the, the seabed is free of sediment, so we don't have to um, model the entire area, any, entire area anyway. So what we did was for um, the tidal modeling, we selected the, um, the, the area here. And then for wave energy extraction modeling, the, 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 the bay, scale of, uh, uh, bay of scale um, shown here. OK. Um, we, and you heard about the wave modeling um, and also uh, hydrodynamic modeling and how you include um, um, turbines in the modeling systems, etc. So I'm not going to talk about them at all. And then um, we use three different models, Mike 3 and Delf 3D, and using three uh, and we use 3D modeling to look at uh, sediment dynamics. Now, in terms of data requirements, all the boundary conditions for uh, wave, wave and tidal boundaries came from the large-scale modeling the other groups did on hydrodynamics and wave modeling. And in addition to that, we needed sediment sizes, sediment extent, uh, sand coverage areas uh, in the selected study areas, which came from 
uh, Marine Scotland video tro trolls, multi-beam data, and BGS sampling. And unfortunately, we don't have any uh, any data on Morpher Dynamics to calibrate or validate our model. So we had to basically um, rely on sensitivity tests and uh, uh, tests to uh, to make sure that we, the modeling is going in the right direction. And these models, the the head sediment transport and Morpher Dynamic models in both Mike and Dell's modeling suits are very very well calibrated. So we have some confidence on uh, I mean confidence on uh, the results that we get. Uh, to tell you a little bit about the mic modeling we did, here is the computational grid um, covering the Pentland Firth, um, uh, uh, Pentland Firth, and the the model was um, validated. Hydrodynamics of the model was validated and cal calibrated against three AD ADCP um, um, data sets. And then we ran the models for to to cover various different scenarios. One of the things that I'm presenting here is that uh, we, we try to um, look at the cumulative impacts of different uh, different arrays uh, as opposed to the impacts of uh, individual arrays. So we, did, we ran the models with the four, four um, different arrays that you see here in the, in the area. And then we ran the models with the, um, the single array scenario cases. And then we add them all together to see whether there are um, nonlinear interactions between the array systems which will have different impacts on the seabed than having individual individual arrays. At least in this scale, actually, I, I should mention you that you know the, the scale of modeling here, we are not resolving the turbulent scale modeling, turbulent scale here. There's more, most sort of it's coastal area area scales. If the uh, uh, the grid size is like you know a couple of meters, well, 10 to 20 meters in some of the areas that we model. So it's it's not the turbulent scale. So we don't see the turbulent scale impacts here, but we focus mainly on um, sort of, you know, um, not not the, the impacts from the wake, but impacts from the change in current and the waves here. So at least for that, uh, that scenarios, we, d we didn't see any change between the, uh, or we didn't, see, we didn't see any impacts of inter-array interactions at this stage and also the, the time scale of modeling we did, the maximum uh, time scale that we covered here is uh, one month. Um, and then uh, we went in to look at some of the higher energy extraction, um, uh, large energy extraction scenarios here, so the, the scenarios that we developed within the model. And, and then we found out that the, 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 as the current changes, the sediment transport pathways can change uh, significantly, which may have impacts on the, uh, on the seabed uh, as a result of the, the dynamics of the, the, um, the current, current system. The, changes to the dynamics of the current system. Now, um, the project is, the work is still ongoing actually. Now we had done is we had included uh, wave current interaction and then we are planning to see how the wave current interaction will impact uh, the changes on the, uh, the sediment dynamics. Now, in terms of Delft's 3D modeling, uh, this is the, um, the last of the cascade of uh, nested models we used for uh, the modeling sediment dynamics in Delft. Actually, we started with the, the big model Simon showed you, and then there was an intermediate model bringing down the, the hydrodynamics into, at the intermediate scale, and the smallest model here with a resolution of 20 meter grid. Um, and in this case, we particularly look at these two sandbanks around the island of Stroma and looked at the, the current situation, current, current dynamics of the system, and then we install the implement the, the turbines in the system to see how these sandbanks uh, sand, sandbanks change. So here are some of the results of the current current situation there after the one month of uh, two, two neap spring tidal uh, cycles. You could see that the sandbanks are quite dynamic, bo both sandbanks uh, in the sides of the island of Stroma. So you can see that uh, a meter, half a meter change can be seen within uh, within one or uh, two spring neap cycles, which shows us that the sandbanks are quite dynamic under the present hydrodynamic regime. And then we are, at the, at, at the moment, we are sort of implementing turbines in the model to see how uh, energy extraction can change um, these, uh, these sandbanks. So, but we can expect that since they are quite dynamic at the moment, any changes to the, the current system would have uh, some impacts on the uh, on the sandbank dynamics. Yeah, so we we plan to do some longer term simulations. Of course, this is 
just a one month simulation which may not be long enough for us to uh, come into concrete uh, conclusions as to how the sandbanks behave uh, under energy extraction scenarios so we are planning to do some long term simulations and then we'll be introducing um, energy extraction scenarios and then finally to look at how sandbanks behave uh, behaves um, under energy extraction now, in terms of wave energy extraction in Bay of Scale, uh, we weren't that much successful here for a number of reasons. Uh, now, we selected Bay of Scale purely because of the fact that this is where we, the, I mean, the Bay of Scale is quite close to one of the, the large um, uh, potential wave energy extraction sites. Uh, and also, we had some information um, in the area. So, for that simple reason, we selected this particular case. And Bay of Scale is in Embed Beach. It's a nice pocket pocket beach in the in the west coast of Opney and it is a soft dominated beach um, subtidal region is almost sediment free it is just bedrock but you can see a, 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 um, a lens of sand mobile sediment in the swash area in the surf and swash areas and it is a very complex environment uh, when it comes to uh, sediment dynamics so since we didn't have any uh, any measured data of how the, the beach behaves under uh, normal circumstances, I mean without energy extraction, what we, we did was we went in to um, uh, measure some profiles to see how, uh, how the profiles look like and how they behave uh, over a period of a week. So um, Ian was expecting a, a storm to come uh, during that time, but unfortunately there wasn't a storm, so we just got the... Um, the, the profile behavior under uh, uh, calm conditions. And then we uh, set up MIC models to model the, the, the wave, uh, wave environment and the sediment environment there uh, and did some comparisons. But it, you can see that, uh, I mean, the, the profile change wasn't, I mean, in some of the cases, uh, the model captured the, uh, the profile behavior quite, quite nicely, but uh, in some of the situations it, it didn't uh, actually. Uh, what we found out that you know this beach is swash dominated and the mic model doesn't capture the swash uh, swash um, um, sediment transport processes quite well so that was uh, we think one of the reasons that uh, we didn't get uh, good results but anyway we we went into um, sort of ex explore the impacts of uh, sediment dynamics based on the model uh, model modeling we could do and then found out that uh, some some changes were found in some parts of the beach, and some some parts of the beach are more sensitive to uh, to sediment uh, energy extraction than the others. But however, in this case, I mean uh, the, the the results we've got, we have very less confidence on the results because we don't. One thing is because we don't have any long-term data to compare the results with. The other thing is that we are not confident that the mic is picking up the the swash processes um, adequately enough. Okay, uh, going into conclusions now. Um, the in terms of tidal energy extraction, the the, mo the sediment transport and the morphodynamic model um, captured well captured the physics involved uh, in the in the, the sediment dy dynamics. And um, despite the lack of uh, calibration data, actually we have quite quite good confidence on the models because they are well calibrated and validated for various uh, sediment sizes, various environments. And also we went in to do some uh, sensitivity tests to see how the changes in sediment, uh, uh, sediment sizes and um, how the models will respond to changes in sediment sizes, etc. Uh, and then the other conclusion we came into is that this nonlinear uh, cumulative impacts is not important at least at this stage or at least the early stages of the development uh, development or within this short period of time that we modeled um, and when we increase the energy uh, extraction then we could clearly see the changes to the hydrodynamics and then uh, to the sediment transport regime as well and uh, the sandbank areas are particularly uh, sensitive to the uh, the the tidal currents with the tidal current regime which may have significant impacts from the energy extraction scenarios, the energy extraction. And then in terms of wave energy, um, well, it is not a 100% um, successful story here. The complexity of the environment and the lack of data uh, made the modeling quite challenging for us. 
Um, and then uh, because of the source dominance in the system, which is not captured by the model, uh, gave, you know, uh, uh, the, because of that, the, the confidence we have on the results is quite low. And, uh, but the, I, I think, you know, the wave energy extraction may have more impact on the environment, more than the tidal energy extraction, because uh, one thing is the, the wave energy devices are much more closer to the shoreline than the tidal devices. So, uh, and also, the, if, if there are any impacts from waves, then the near shore areas may have significant changes in terms of um, beach evolution or beach change, beach erosion. So, that is something we need to look at in detail. Thank you. Um, so biological life is lived by extremes, not averages, i.e. one bad day could be the end. What is the real time scale of the dynamics you see in this movement of sediment that we that you think we should be thinking about? Is it the annual peak or in you know, a worst case scenario? Well, ideally, what we'll be looking at is the, the extreme extreme scenarios, isn't it? Um, now, unfortunately, here we didn't. Now, in in the wave modeling that we did, we modeled the, the the time time scale that we did measurements in terms of wave modeling. So we didn't capture this storm we were looking for, unfortunately. But ideally, actually, what what we are what we are trying to do now is to to capture two um, storm conditions, and Ian is running models to. To capture the, to see how the um, the, the seabed change within those two uh, storm conditions. I mean, now th these two are sort of quite quite intense storms, but we haven't calculated how much what is the return return period of these storms or anything like that. But just to see how these big waves will change the um, uh, the, the change the results. And also in terms of tidal modeling, now um, we are we have started incorporating wave current interactions, so we'll be able to see the impact of extreme situations, extreme conditions on um, the the bed change. Yeah. Sorry, actually, we're running a little bit late. Okay. Well, Harshin has just been talking to you about what we call bed load transport. So this is the, uh, the horizontal transport of rather coarse material, uh, mostly sand particles, uh, which are uh, hopping and jumping and rolling along along this <coughs> bed. So I'm going to talk about the suspended load transport, and that's a different matter altogether, because here we're talking about very fine particles which are lifted right up into the water column by the vertical diffusivity uh, created by, by wave, wave and tidal flows. And uh, that, that's an, another matter altogether. So why are we interested in this? Well, we're interested in it because turbidity controls the penetration of light into the ocean. And that's a really key aspect of an ecosystem uh, that determines primary production, determines the extent to which fish larvae can hide from predators um, species composition, a whole range of aspects of, of, the, of the world in the sea are determined by how much light gets in. So this line here, it represents the depth to which 1% of the sea surface light gets into the ocean as a function of turbidity. Now 1% sea surface light is roughly the, uh, the radiance at which photosynthesis is exactly balanced by respiration. So more or less Above this line, you're going to get net positive photosynthesis. Down below, respiration is going to dominate. So this is the euphotic zone, the bit of the system which can produce primary production. And this is the dark bit where fish larvae can hide from predators. So turbidity is really important. Turbidity is caused mostly in shelf seas, coastal seas, by uh, fine-grained uh, suspended particulate mineral matter. So this is stuff of the order of 10 to 30 microns particle size, not the sort of uh, 200 to 500 particle sizes that uh, you get you get in sand grains. So the factors affecting suspended material up in the water column are really really quite complicated. The material in the water column itself, the grain size is important, the fall velocity, the sinking rate is important, and that's a, a function of its shape as well as its size. And then you've got flocculation, aggregation processes going on uh, between particles as they collide, especially for very fine ones. 
the sediment on the seabed, the extent to which that can be eroded by bed shear stress is very important. That's a function of grain size composition. So we've got very mixed sediments. The fine material can hide amongst the bigger particles. We've got cohesion forces, which are electrochemical forces acting between fine particles. Consolidation due to biological activity. Bacteria produce sticky chemicals that bind stuff together. Compaction due to pressure. And then you've got bed form, bed form architecture story, uh, which is controlling or influencing the extent to which particle grains can be lifted off the seabed by shear. And, uh, and linking all that together, of course, is the hydrodynamics. So up in the water column, it's vertical diffusivity, which is controlling the extent to which a particle will either be lifted into suspension or will sink out of suspension due to gravity. And you've got the bed shear stress, which is acting to lift particle or mobilize material off the seabed. And the, these are a, a function of both the, the current velocity, due to tides and the residual currents, but also wave orbital velocities. So we need to worry here quite a lot about the combination of waves and tides. We can't really think about them as separate, separate processes. And uh, it's these things that are going to be affected by tidal energy extraction in the first instance. So the problem of suspended particle concentration modeling is a 3D problem, not a 2D problem, which is what really bed load transport is all about. And unfortunately, there really aren't any analytical solutions, any analytical models for a lot of the processes that we're talking about here. So the shear threshold for mobilizing particles in sediment mixtures is entirely empirical. So the sinking speed, even simple things like the sinking speed of, of, of particles when you get down to these small scales, when you're outside the sort of Reynolds shear stress story, you've got odd shaped particles, entirely empirical. Sediment consolidation, almost no information at all, even empirical, about how biology affects the erodibility of sediments. So we're really in a tricky area here, and very heavily reliant on empirical characterizations. Now there's no doubt you can implement suspended sediment simulations in 3D hydrodynamic systems. And you, there is a mic module that will do it, Delft do it, Polcom, Technicon. But the problem is it's so cumbersome and computationally heavy that it, it's worth, you know, parameterizing it and adjusting parameters and tuning it is worse than monkey and typewriter. It's monkey with a gluey typewriter. It's almost impossible. So many investigators who are in the suspended sediment game have, have given up with 3D models and look at 1D vertical models because then they, they've got something that runs faster and they can explore the processes and do many, many model runs to, to optimize the parameters where we've got data. So it's cheaper, it's much more uh, intensive optimization possible. But of course, we're assuming when we do that that most of the suspended material is being lifted vertically off the seabed and is not being carried into our picture by horizontal transport. But in most cases, that's true. So we built our own model. And I'll very quickly run through what it is. So this is the bit of the model that tells us what's happening up in the water column. So it's saying that the suspended concentration at some altitude above the seabed is a function of the concentration just above the seabed and this function which is called the Roos number. And the Roos number is a thing like this. It's, it's sort of this ratio of uh, sinking speed times some uh, times concentration. And this is the bit which is a caricature of this flocculation aggregation process. The von Kahn constant, which people who do turbulence closure modeling will be very familiar with, and the bed shear velocity. So, so this is some characterization of the vertical profile of diffusivity up through the water column. And then the other bit of the story is how much sediment is being lifted off the seabed. So this is the SDM concentration of our reference height, one meter per foot of the seabed. There's a proportionality constant which links it to the measurements that we're making. And then there's the mud content of the sediment. So mud is particles which are smaller than 63 microns. A term for the erodibility, and then the shear, but shear stress, not the instantaneous shear stress in this model, but it's a, it's a sort of autocorrelation time lagged value of shear stress, looking back in time, because of course sediment lifted off, sediment, sediment falling onto the seabed now reflects an erosion event sometime in the past. So we need this time lag process in the model as well. So we need some data. This is a really data hungry exercise. Not much data in the of birth and fertility. So we went to the east coast of Scotland down here at Stonehaven, where Marine Scotland had been going out and doing surveys for a long time. Then we had 
A data set at one minute intervals over four days at one site, daily intervals over a week at another site, monthly intervals over a year for seven sites, weekly intervals over three and a half years, two sites. So we have a lot of turbidity profile data. Turbidity proportional to suspended sediment concentration. So we built a hydrodynamic model. We built a coupled, a linked wave tide model in Mike for this East Coast region. So we actually, there was interaction going on between waves and tides. Uh, and validated against tide gauge data, currently today from wave boy data. And that we used that to calculate bed shear stress at 30 minute intervals for three and a half years to use the sites using an algorithm from H.R. Wallingford to, to combine wave and current uh, of shear velocities. We had seabed surveys of bathymetry and grain size. Those are the input to our model for turbidity, so that gave us capability to predict turbidity profiles at uh, in principle at 30 minute intervals. We had 34,000 turbidity observations. Split that into a, sub, a calibration subset of 12,000 and a validation subset of 22,000. Then we used numerical optimization to uh, find the set of parameters that gives the best fit between the model and the observed turbidity for the nine parameters that went into this model. So here's our predictions of the vertical profiles of turbidity at the sites. So on the left here is the calibration data. And the black line and the gray shading is the um, median and 95th to 95th percentile range of turbidity for the model. Um, the red line and the dashed uh, red lines is the median and the range 5th to 95th percentiles for the observations. So, for example, this site, the model and the observations are really very convergent. This one, the, the median turbidity is very well predicted, but the model don't predicting, under predicting the extremes of turbidity. And, uh, well, you, you can look through it. On the right is the validation data. So the data, these data didn't go into the model optimization. And you can see it's still doing really rather well. So it's pretty good, a pretty good job of predicting vertical distributions of turbidity. In time series mode, this is data for one site. So this is current speed and significant wave height for that site split into years. And now we've got data for two depth horizons, five meters below the surface, five meters above the seabed. The black line is the model, and the red line is the data. This is the calibration period. That's the validation period. So these data didn't go into the parameterizing model. And there's some extraordinary matches there and there between the model and the observations. We were really picking up spring leap cycles and wave storm events. Now you'll notice this seasonal cycle in turbidity in both the observations and the model. And you might think that those were due to this seasonality in the, in the significant wave height, and partly is. But it's also very strongly affected by the, by the erodibility. So it turns, turns out that there's a strong seasonality in the erodibility of the sediment. And this is very strongly correlated with the uh, chlorophyll content of the sediment. So it's a biological effect, which is binding the sediment together in the summer. And it's not so bound together in the winter. And uh, it turns out that biology is having a big feedback effect on the turbidity in water. So, a little bit of sensitivity analysis with respect to um, wave and tidal energy extraction. So this is um, it's a bit sort of abstract because, of course, there's not have any devices here. But scenario one, we extracted um, half the wave energy, the wave power in the system, uh, which was uh, 7.4 kilowatts per meter. So we took half of it out as uh, of the wave energy, but we did a 29% reduction in the average uh, wave height. And we took out the same amount of energy by uh, attenuating the tidal current speed and not the waves. So that was six and a half percent reduction in the depth average current speed. And then because that was all very small, we had a third scenario where we attenuated the depth average current speed by 50%, which represented a removal of around 80% of the power. So the question is, would we be able to detect the changes in turbidity that the model predicts given the noise and the variability in, the, in observations? So here's the results. So this axis, we've got the model stability in the natural system. 
and the dots, the symbols here, represent the observed ability in the natural system. So we've got some dashed lines here, which are the 95% confidence intervals around the regression of observed ability against modeled ability in the natural system. And the wide dashed lines are prediction interval of observed ability given the modeled stability in the natural system. And then the black, red, um, blue and green little dots here are that uh, first two scenarios where we took out 3.7 kilowatts per meter by either way or tidal like, abstraction. And they all lie within even 95% confidence intervals in that direction. So that tells me that we wouldn't be able to detect that level of any edge extraction given our uncertainty in our ability to measure stability in the field. It's not till we take out 50% of the current speed that we start to see here in this gray area that the, the predicted stability starts to come outside the variability that we have in real world observations. So that's the scale of reduction in current speed that we have to, that we have to do in order to be able to detect it in this system. So in summary, we, we built and parameterized a model that we can use to quickly and relatively easily scope the effects of energy abstraction on suspended uh, matter in the water column stability. We applied it to the East Coast, where we've got this huge data set. But unfortunately, there aren't any, there are no known in situ measurement of stability in the fourth waters that we could use to parameterize this, which is a, a serious problem. But there are some satellite data. So on the left here is satellite data for the east coast of Scotland where we were working. And these satellite data plotted as a time series match really well the, the model, the observed ability that we measured in situ from the boat. These are the satellite data for the Pentland Firth or the Orkney waters, calculated using the same algorithm for extracting suspended <coughs> sediment from uh, the reflectance data. The first thing you can see is the scale is very different. So the top here is three, which is like down here on this picture. So all the waters don't have very much sediment in them. But we could, in principle, use these, these data as a data set that we could, we could calibrate our, our model with. But I think we have to realize what the expectations are from this sort of modeling. This is a Landsat image of a wind farm in the Thames estuary. So the dots here are the pylons for the wind farms, for the, for the wind turbines. And what you're seeing here is the wake, suspended sediment in the wake from each of those pylons. And that's kicked up into the water by the turbulence in the wake. Our model isn't going to address that. We're not going to resolve the turbulence associated with wake effects like that. But what we can offer to do is to say, in the much broader scale, the, the broad scale footprint, which may be many, many kilometers out from an array, what our expectations would be for changes in turbidity and changes in light penetration into the water. That's it. Thank you. model in reverse to find out what the turbidity levels are in the water and um, to then extract that from the chlorophyll, the, the, the error in the chlorophyll. Don't, don't need to do that. So the standard algorithms that NASA produce for uh, estimating chlorophyll from reflectance are all based on calibrations in uh, what they call type 1 water out in the middle of the Pacific. As soon as you come into coastal waters, those calibrations go straight to the dust tank. Yeah. So you have to start yourself and redo it. So the guys that produce those pictures have done that. They've gone out to see and measured reflectance with sensors in the waters that are relevant. And, and they've got the algorithms for teasing apart chlorophyll and suspended sediment without having to so do what you suggest. So I could provide another picture of chlorophyll, of chlorophyll and one alongside it suspended sediment. And they're quite different. Right. So, you know, the algorithms are just doing that without having to resort to that kind of methods. The other option is this question is of the, the coffee break as well, but I'm keen to try and keep this all the time, so I'm right, um, 
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's quite appropriate that I should be starting a little bit late here. As you'll have gathered uh, from John, um, this particular work stream is somewhat delayed, uh, being a rather downstream uh, work stream as part of Terawatt. So what I'm going to present to you today uh, is not actually outcomes uh, from work stream 4, but a gentle ramble, I think, through some thoughts uh, along the way. So um, the thought, those thoughts uh, today are, are mine. Um, Mike Burrows from SAMS has also been working on Workstream 4, uh, looking largely at uh, intertidal and shallow subtidal work. Uh, I'm not going to show you any of those results, but I shall say a little bit about uh, some of the benthic and demersal uh, work that we're looking at. So these are the areas I'm going to be uh, covering. Uh, I'll tell you what the task is. Um, in order to be able to undertake the task, we need to decide how we represent uh, waves and tides in a biologically meaningful way. Uh, we need to look at what else we need to know in order to be able to predict things uh, about the ecology. Uh, what, other, what, other, what other kinds of environmental variables should we take on board? And what are the hazards uh, for particular uh, variables that we might consider? Uh, I'll very briefly touch on uh, modeling approaches. Uh, I'll be honest, I, when I started this work, I thought that was maybe largely the focus of this work. Um, I realized later on that that's probably the least interesting part of that, but I will tell you a little bit about that. And I'll finish <coughs> off by saying something about where this uh, work might be leading in terms of um, defining a framework for uh, acceptable limits of change. So the task is relatively straightforward, uh, I think. Uh, we have uh, this marvelous suite of wave and tidal models. We have data on the distribution of marine uh, organisms. Let's make some uh, ecological models. Um, and they're very easy to do here, here for example, using uh, some bryozoan data collated by uh, Sally Rouse in a previous incarnation when she was at Harriet Watt University. Uh, it's a MaxM model for uh, bryozoan species. Uh, they're very easy to put together. What's more new and interesting, uh, I think, though, is to take some of the very creative things that are being done in the earlier work streams in terms of developing scenarios for energy extraction uh, model and modeling methods for energy extraction uh, and putting those into projected uh, models. So let's have a look into the future uh, to see what uh, eco the projected uh, ecology might look like. And that, in a nutshell, is the task of work stream four. Um, so as I said, first we need to decide what's biologically meaningful in uh, the way of uh, waves and tides. Well, a lot of the traditional outputs that would be uh, of interest uh, coming out of hydrodynamic models like wave height, wave power, uh, current speed, they're not necessarily the most useful things uh, in terms of uh, ecology. So um, what we probably do want to look at is more what forces are being experienced uh, on the seabed by the organisms there. Um, so variables related particularly to shear stress uh, owing to waves and tides are, lot, are likely to be a lot better. And by couching variables in this way, we can, we can at least uh, account for uh, the effects of depth, which things like wave height do not. Um, it's worth noting along the way that um, extremes, as uh, Beth hinted earlier, extremes are probably at least as important uh, as the central tendency uh, in the day. So extremes and variability are very well worth looking at. And there may be other indices like uh, this um, depth over uh, velocity cubed uh, that might be uh, of interest in defining uh, features of uh, biological interest. Uh, I'm not, not really going to show you very much. I just thought, uh, as we had some data here, uh, I'll show you some um, distributions of uh, wave stress values. This is for uh, just three uh, particular points, taking out from Benke's model, I think it's a six hourly data over the course of a year. Um, I've represented that on a log scale, uh, simply because the uh, extremes of the variation, uh, there's a really very long tail uh, on that. So there's no point really to make from here except to say that we can calculate these things uh, and it's worth using um, a number of different percentiles and 
statistics related to the percentiles of that distribution to take forward into our models. <laughs> what about other variables? Uh, well, other environmental variables are clearly uh, going to come into uh, our models if they're going to be very successful in uh, predicting. Um, so uh, those might have various roles. Um, they might act directly upon uh, uh, the habitat. They might, uh, wave, waves and tides is obviously going to be one of those. Um, but there's various other proxies and indirect effects that we need to consider along the way. I think any of us could very quickly come up with a list of uh, candidate uh, variables. So here's a, a list uh, along the left. Um, I think it's worth thinking about, though, that some of these contain hazards. Uh, and the main consideration that I would see is we, we should only include uh, variables that we can actually project uh, into the future. So there are certain things we can cross out straight away, particularly things uh, where, although we might be able to make some useful statements about uh, effects, we can't predict wholesale across the spatial domain, uh, across the spatial domains that we're looking at what, how the substrate is going to change in response to changes in the hydrodynamic variables. And that's fairly fundamental uh, in terms of uh, predicting uh, ecology. Um, that means, I think, it's a dangerous thing to include in the, mo in the model. We therefore uh, cut out such things. Uh, I won't go much further into this, but except to say there are certain proxy variables we might also be a little bit wary of, things that might proxy for, uh, things that might uh, be related to survey bias, particularly for inc incidence data. Um, while we're on this slide, you'll notice that on uh, the right-hand side of the slide, we're talking about habitat. We're not talking about predicting uh, the numbers uh, or occurrence of species where it, we're attempting to describe, perhaps not even habitat, perhaps we're, we're attempting to describe the environmental envelope within which uh, habitat might occur. We're not really looking at the right spatial scale to describe habitat as such. But we're, what we're doing is we're predicting a set of environmental conditions. We're not saying necessarily that that will be realized in terms of future biological distributions. Modeling approaches, a quick gallop here, worth considering what different types of data we're looking at. We have incidence uh, data, uh, and Sally's marine bryozoan uh, data is a good example of that. Survey abundance, international bottom trawl survey data uh, gives us very good uh, survey data for demersal fish species. Um, but we also have more sort of group type, uh, category type data like biotopes and assemblages. And the whole suite of, of species distribution modeling uh, techniques, uh, although they're, uh, some of them are relatively recent, they've also evolved very quickly and can now be considered quite mature and certainly very accessible through uh, very freely available, very easily used uh, software. So uh, Maxent uh, would obviously come into that category. Boosted regression trees, I think, is a very promising method um, and certainly don't scorn uh, simple uh, environmental envelopes in that context. And nor do we scorn more traditional techniques uh, such as GAMs. I'm less sure about GLMs, though I've seen a paper recently that did uh, suggest that these were uh, feasible techniques in this context. Uh, and finally, uh, multivariate techniques in uh, particularly the kind of discriminant function type uh, methods like canonical variance analysis, which are applicable to group data. So we're saying, what's the probability, given a set of environmental conditions, what's the probability of being one biotope uh, as opposed to another? And all of these things uh, can give us um, probabilities or uh, intensities related to uh, particular locations uh, in the sea based on those environmental conditions. But well, what's the point? What's the point of all that? Well, when, many years ago, when I described my PhD to my granny, she said, yes, Michael, but what's it all for? And I have to admit, that had me stumped. But I, the point is, there really does have to be a, a point of all uh, behind all of this. So what is the point? Uh, and to me, uh, I think this relates to uh, questions around acceptable limits of change. Um, and here's a few considerations uh, in relation to that. Uh, if we're going to look at the potential impact of a development uh, on uh, a benthic distribution, 
uh, or distribution of a benthic habitat type, we do need to consider certain things like variable baselines. There's a background of natural change that will come more into ecowatt than it does into terawatt. Um, and set, this, set any impact against the cumulative impacts uh, of all the developments that might be in a particular round. Now, I think what we have here, using essentially a projection uh, method, uh, is a way of making these issues rather more tractable. Uh, we've got uh, models that describe habitat suitability. Uh, they don't predict distribution. We've got models that compare, compare projections with other projections, not data. Well, those sound like bad things, but I think in this context, uh, it really is quite helpful in the sense that we have our best description of how a particular area of seabed might suit a particular organism or a biotope. Uh, let's see how that conception would change best on, based on our best idea of how the environment, the environment <coughs> would change. And all the things like background variability um, fall into the task that relates to preparing data to, to, for us to develop that understanding. Um, where we look at things like background change, we can, we can project based uh, on other elements uh, of natural change that might be happening. So again, we're project, comparing projections with projections. Um, and what metrics might we use? Well, I think it, it serves to be fairly simple-minded about this. So basically, we're saying how much change uh, overall uh, and how much displacement and where does it go? And I won't linger over these except uh, to note that there are various scaling, in fact, scaling factors in these equations which uh, are intended to make these metrics relatively meaningful. So it's scaling factors relating to the areas over which one's uh, got, uh, made, made the predictions. It relates to particularly to uh, the spatial scales uh, at which organisms uh, might move. Uh, and looking at it in, in these terms, in terms of displacement, spatial displacement, uh, overall change, we can develop measures which respond to these various kinds of shifts uh, and changes. And I think um, here I'll start to train my background as a fishery scientist. I like to work with things that look like biological reference points and these kinds of phase diagrams. So we can put, make a phase diagram where we have these two dimensions of change, overall change uh, and displacement. So overall change can be positive or negative. Displacement, uh, in the way I've defined it, only goes in one way. I can start putting uh, thresholds and limits uh, on that. So looking at biological reference points. And if you start doing that, you're actually just starting to define where there might be acceptable uh, and unacceptable uh, kinds of change. Um, I won't pick apart the, the choices I've made here in, in colouring those particular areas. Uh, they could get, perhaps get the point that, their, that displacement and change are to some extent interactive, uh, that negative uh, changes uh, are more important than positive changes. But a positive change is also uh, of interest uh, if um, the, there is a displacement which is greater than the mobility. Uh, the mobility or dispersal ability can cope with. So the final uh, point is to actually place your development plus uh, it's un the uncertainty about where you are on that. And that is really my conception of what we could possibly do uh, with these modeling approaches. Um, I'll wait for to see what Ian Davis might think of this kind of uh, approach. Uh, he's certainly not seen this uh, at this point. Well, I'm not going to. I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to give you any conclusions, basically, because we've not yet concluded. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Come quickly while I'm to set up the last five minutes. It does matter where it is because 
but different locations differ in other respects, which may or may not be beneficial for that particular uh, organism that you're focusing, focusing on. So there may be a net gain or loss uh, in habitat for a particular species or group, uh, and uh, there may be changes which occur at a rate which may be greater than the ability to respond, the organism to respond. So we may, we may have had fun for the scenarios we have in Terrawatt. No, there's nothing we can do that looks particularly terrible. Uh, but we at least need to put that in a framework where we can make that track. Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times about positive impacts. Yeah. But can we view any change outside natural variability as being positive? Because it's such a subjective thing to say. So we might say an increase in lobsters or large pressure fish are positive, but that may have a negative effect on the ecological function of that habitat. Um, so you know, yeah, how can we justify that green bar which goes further into the left being positive? Well, I think that that is predicated on the fact that you that each one of these things that you look at will not be the only one such a diagram. If there are losers, you hope to, hope to be able to be looking at losers. And on, on the loser diagram, you will see <laughs> going over into, into the red. Whereas we might consider you know, losses ever increasing might be a, uh, a good thing. I would certainly think that. And that might be, uh, as you said, there might be other consequences. But we would hope to include that in our suite of indicators. And that's my view. Okay, there's opportunities to come back on, on all of us, I guess, after the, the coffee break this afternoon. Um, but no sooner have we started Terrawatt than I think we kind of began to think about this the other way around. I mean, in one sense, Terrawatt is much more focused on the benefits and demersal processes and less so perhaps on pelagic processes of the water column. But I think also, in relation to the scale of development that we expected in that first round of licensing, and then the work that was going on in marine spatial planning, where you saw huge areas potentially opening up for marine renewables development. We kind of, the consortium began to turn this round on its head. Um, and the other thing is, well, if we're looking to the future, 2015, when the scale of development might be massive, the chances are that climate change will have already had a major impact on the marine environment. So sitting down again with Marine Scotland, EcoWalk 2050 was born, with the same Terrawatt consortium plus two new partners to help us with those new questions. Beth Scott from the University of Aberdeen and Judith Wolf Co. from NOCL uh, Liverpool. So here the questions posed by the regulator are slightly different. Again, it's an EPSRC funded grand challenge problem uh, project. The role of marine spatial planning you know, what does that play now in large scale, very large scale, these very large scale array deployments? The criteria to determine the ecological limits. In other words, if we have a good understanding of significance, what actually or are there ecological limits to marine energy extraction as a consequence? How can we differentiate these changes from changes that are going to occur as a consequence of climate change? And living in Orkney, I see all around me the influence of climate change already, and a concern that if we had large-scale deployments at this point in time, some of those changes might have been put on the shoulders of marine renewable development. So the regulator needs to be able to differentiate those changes. How might very large-scale arrays, and this to my mind comes back to that positive point as well, how can very large-scale array deployments ameliorate or exacerbate the effects of climate change. In other words, can we use these deployments in some ways to offset or mitigate the effects of climate change? I think Ian Davis puts this as a rather different way. How can marine planning policy maximize the potential marine renewables extraction while minimizing environmental impacts and ensuring that we meet the requirements of uh, European law? So again, it's project managed by MAS. Again, Marine Scotland Science are full uh, partners in it. Um, we will update position papers. In fact, the next one coming along will be the climate change scenario we're working uh, to for 2050, which is being produced by NOCL. Um, and in addition to Mike and the other models, Delft, I guess, 
uh, we have new models that we're using which have emerged from the activities of Marine Scotland Science as part of its work uh, behind the scenes on licensing. And that's FV, <coughs> but also on the wave side to get a much, much better uh, representation of very large scale wave arrays than using WAM. Um, it's even more ambitious, I think, in the sense that there are flows of data and methods from one work stream to another. Uh, and I think we are hoping, finally, with EcoWatt, working with Marine Scotland Science, to have much greater clarity on this concept of significance. I think very few of us in Terrawatt suspect on the scale of development we're envisaging in round one licensing, we will have very much in the way of environmental effect. But when you look at that map that Rory put up earlier of those areas that are opened up for licensing, potentially for licensing in future rounds, um, filling those with marine turbines, with wave energy devices, could have a very different effect. Um, as always, it's really important that we do have industry engagement in these projects. We've been so grateful for that with Terrawatt and really keen if anyone here would like to be more involved with the steering group uh, in the project. We're very keen to welcome you in. I've got a few other slides which I'm actually going to skip through because it seems to me my responsibility. I couldn't keep, a lot, keep people on time. But what I thought I'd finish with uh, just to show you how things are changing in Orkney, was just to take two fish species which you probably wouldn't expect to see in Orkney waters. The first are anchovies, um, and here you have 10-year or decade or uh, indexes of the currents in uh, the pink area or the, the, the shaded area that you see. So 73 to 82, uh, 83 to 92, 93 to 2002, 2003 to 2012. So it's quite interesting that when I first moved to Orkney 26 years ago, I would be very surprised if you said we would have anchovies in Orkney waters. Um, and I'll do the same here just for the pilchard. You can do this for a number of species now, uh, but you see the very, very same pattern. So just in the time scale that I've lived in Orkney, a number of uh, pelagic fishes, you'd expect pelagic things to move more quickly than those attached to the seabed, um, but already appearing surprisingly in the waters. On that note, I'll let you all go off and have some coffee. I'm going to get some help, I think, after the coffee break uh, with chairing that session. But if you've got questions to those that gave presentations, that would be good. Um, but also in points of discussion that people have about the Terrawatt project, I'm very keen to capture those uh, and maybe try and learn from those as well in the work on equal opportunity. So thank you very much for your attention this afternoon.